Today, we are very privileged to have amongst us an in this institute, Professor Joe Ritson, who has uh, an amazing profile and CV because he is not only an academic, but he has also done a lot to make change happen and transformation happen, both at the international level via the World Bank as its vice president and also in the Netherlands as its education minister. And uh, I would recommend you to read his books on education. Anybody who is interested in education and how it has to be transformed in Europe would do well to read them. So, Joe, may I please call you and ask a couple of questions. So, when did the, you can read them out. When did the worst happen in the Netherlands? And what did the government do about it? So, first of all, I feel this to be my privilege. So, it's clear from what also Shiyama said, and I really congratulate you with having organized this. Uh, this is marvelous. It's also very important, I think, to share our notions uh, in order to make progress, to come to better situations. Um, but what she particularly underlined is that I don't have any knowledge about water policy. Well, I have some knowledge, of course, but uh, as uh, experience, so I was education minister, I'm an economist and also a, um, a physicist, but um, I talk about, um, first of all, as an answer to the first question about Dutch Delta policy. And um, I complement that with the new insights of uh, the years, I would say, from two years ago, but even of the 1990s, when we had to rethink how climate change is going to affect flooding and water policy. So then I start with something which shook up the country um, and where I also give two different perspectives to it. Uh, this is the flooding of 1953, when 2,000 people died in a country with, at that time, some 12 million. Um, that shook up the country in terms of the devastation which took place. And I remember it very much as a small kid uh, coming uh, on Sunday morning back from church, from a Catholic mass, and feeling that it was almost impossible to walk the streets because of the strong winds and the snow, and with the alarm on uh, the radio. And so always, uh, I noticed this also, we then first focus on the number of people who died or are injured. Um, that was for the Netherlands a huge number. Uh, the second is what we focused on is on economic damage. And here is something quite interesting. Um, I calculated, recalculated the economic damage at that time, which was 10% of GDP. It was 10% of GDP. The third thing I very much find interesting in this is no one ever thought about the psychological damage, the feeling of uncertainty, uh, the feeling also of not being uh, able to live their lives uh, as, as is normally the case. And this is particularly the thing which now comes through almost daily um, uh, on radio and television of the survivors of that um, major flooding. And maybe just want to add here, I happen to be also in East Pakistan at the Bola cyclone, uh, which went, by the way, unnoticed in the Dutch newspapers or in any other European newspaper. We were in Dhaka and we asked the people in Europe, so what has happened? Can you see what is happening here? It was 300,000 at least, but it may have been 500,000. Um, so we uh, went there and buried the death and tried to get as much support as we could do with people who were there. So here are the questions. What was the policy reaction? The result in any new programs, policies or institutes? The Delta works came about as a result of the 95, uh, 1953 uh, floodings, and they were huge. They were huge by all accounts. 
Um, so it was a plan to reduce uh, the limits of chances of flooding from the sea to one in 10,000 years. And everything was going to be uh, done for that. It was a project for 50 years, but it was major. Um, just important maybe to mention, uh, this happened, and at the same time, the Dutch economy did extremely well. There was never a time when the Dutch economy did so well. So reactions to flooding in terms of investing in avoiding new floods is economically a smart thing to do. I mean, that is, I think, a lesson which can be drawn. I haven't seen it anywhere on paper, but I was really surprised to look into the figures. The second is, of course, that you can do whatever you want, but you have to create institutions to manage this. So there were all kinds of institutions involved in the dikes, and they were all swiped away and replaced by one big authority. And this is you know, going to be realized by 2050. And then the idea is, so we are safe? No, we are not safe because in the meantime, things have changed. Uh, that is uh, climate change. Uh, and maybe also with a substantial sea level rising. And particularly, what we now need is to look into where the water comes from. So for a long period, the whole of Europe has always worked with the notion, as soon as the rain falls, it has to go to the sea as quickly as possible. Well, in the meantime, we use it also as drainage. Uh, it's uh, kind of we use everything we like to get rid of uh, to throw into the water. But um, that is no longer feasible uh, if you want to avoid floods. Uh, if you want to avoid floods, you have to save the water wherever it falls, almost. I mean, that is reduce the speed by which one drop of water which falls in the north of France reaches the sea. That is now two weeks. And with the same kind of occurrence of rainfalls as we are likely to have, that means that we will have flooding almost every five years. And so I'm particularly interested in uh, hearing also what the dike warden says. Uh, I think that now the elections have said for the dike uh, wardens have said we want one in 100, one chance in 100, which is in my view still a lot. So the uh, chances as I calculate them now are much higher for new floodings. So new floodings will arise unless we make the investment. But the investment can be made, and it's economically wise to do. Um, now, the specific situation then is in Europe almost that you have these borders inside. Uh, so the dike warden is responsible for an area, but um, that borders on nothing, on Belgium and on Germany. So cross-border um, cooperation is essential. And um, then cross-border cooperation means also that the ones who are more hurt by the fast drainage uh, are the ones who have to pay. I mean, this is not something in which uh, you can say, from, well, they should pay for something which happens as bad as us. That's my economist notion. I think the Dutch uh, experience has shown that investment in prevention has a high return in human lives, in value of property, but I would very much like to add, particularly in happiness. Um, and we should spend far more time uh, in um, terms of thinking about the psychological results of the unsafety feeling uh, which people have after a flooding. I see this around here, but I see it also back in all kinds of studies, even in Dhaka, in the coastal areas of Bangladesh, where the psychological impact is something to be valued. We have to start to take that into the calculations. And then for Europe, uh, I think there is a completely new time uh, in the sense that we can no longer accept uh, the notion uh, that uh, we use rivers as drainage. We have to reduce the speed by which the water which falls goes to the sea. We have to make sure that we keep the water where it falls. That's a shortcut. Uh, expression for it. And thank you very much for having this opportunity on this marvelous day. Thank you.